How are you doing? Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Slightly. Pardon? I have $6,000 VA. I pushed the button off. There's one on TV now. Yes, it's worth $60. That's better. I okay. <laughs> now I know what's on, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. And to a great meeting tonight, we're going to have on baseball. And we already had opening day. and. Some of the local teams aren't doing as well as they should, and others are doing better, I heard. Anyway, um, anybody who's interested, we now have a new ornament that uh, we're selling for the archives, to raise money for the archives. It's of the library. It's uh, Sally Gifford O'Brien's drawing, and uh, on the back, there's I can pass it around, and you can look at it. And we have the order forms here for anybody who wants to pick one up and you want to order one. Okay? And we also have anybody who wants to join and be a member or renew your membership, we have the membership forms here. And as always, we're collecting money for the Lori Duncan Historical Society Award that we give to the high school every year uh, to a senior graduating and going on to college. So if anybody wants to contribute, please let us know. All right. Any other announcements? All right. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to John. And he's going to tell us about Millbrook and the baseball. When it really was local. Thank you. Uh, on here it has baseball in Millbrook 1930 to 66. I'm just going to gloss over the 30s because the main period I want to talk about is 1945 to about 1965. Now, <clears throat> how I know about it, when I was from like 7 to 10 years old, I was a ball boy for the Millbrook team. And it's not like a Yankee Stadium, you hit the foul ball and you keep the ball. They needed the balls and they cost money. So we, there was five or six of us kids that used to run after the balls, fight over, fight over them and everything else. At the end of the day, the kid that brought the most foul balls back got to keep a ball. Then when I was about uh, 10 to 13 or 14, I was a bat boy. And in those days, all the bats were uh, hickory, not uh, hickory, uh, ash. And in a typical ball game, they broke two or three bats. We got to keep the broken bats. <laughs> so my brother and I would take the bats home. We would drill holes in them, put screws in them, screw them together, wrap electrician's tape around it. And sometimes we sold them to the other kids for 50 cents <laughs> because the kids couldn't afford bats, but we all used these broken bats. Later in uh, 1963, I went to work at the Poughkeepsie Journal, and a couple years later, they got me on the board of the Interstate Baseball League, which was New York and Connecticut teams. And for the last two years of the league, I was the secretary and the director of umpires. So I had a lot of connection with this baseball. Uh, I, I consider it from the like 46 to uh, the 60s when baseball was king in Millwork. And I had told people over the years they used to draw 1,000 to 3,000 people on, on a Sunday here in Millwork. And since then I found a couple newspaper articles referring to 1,500, 1,800, and even a couple 3,000 uh, people at a game. Now, the best thing that this tells it, the Milbert Field, better than I ever could, that is exactly the way it was. This painting was done in 1953. 
and this was Elm Drive and you can see every 15 or 20 yards both sides of the road were these elm trees and the sun hardly ever shone on Elm Drive. In later years, in the 1960s, they got Elm disease and they died and were all taken down. But this shows a typical crowd at, the, at a Millbrook baseball game. Of course, it doesn't show the numbers there. And in the background is the uh, old grammar school here in Millbrook. I went to fourth, fifth, and sixth grade there. That yellow barn was in fair territory. A lot of home runs were hit over that. And on a typical Sunday, this entire street had people parked on both sides. You could hardly drive through it. Up on this hill behind this little uh, sun stand here was a playground for kids with swings and merry-go-rounds and other things. The people came and sat on blankets. Later, the uh, Millbrook High School used the field for their games, and they had portable bleachers where all these people were standing. They would bring, for the summer, bleachers there. In the winter, to, in the fall, they went out in center field where the high school played football. And so there was no way to keep people out. And you couldn't collect tickets. They used to have two or three guys, some of you people remember the name, uh, Harold Musselswing, uh, Ralph Shar, Al Osika. They went around with a wooden cigar box asking for donations. And people, some people don't have it, don't want it, don't have to. Others would throw a quarter in. 50 cents, some of the people throw a buck or a five, and that's what kept the Millbrook team going for years. I mean, balls cost money, bats cost money, uniforms, and anyway, uh, in the early 1960s, I played Little League, Junior League, and high school ball on this field. There used to be three softball fields out there. In the early 1960s, they knocked down this school and built a large modern uh, elementary school. Where did they build it? Right here. So there is no more Milbert baseball field there. But it was a great time. Uh, Milbert had good baseball teams in the 1920s and 30s including one was the uh, Millbrook Giants, an all-black baseball team, run by a local guy named Ernie Duncan. And in my research, I found that Duncan managed Millbrook, and he provided equipment, uniforms, and roasted woodchuck after every game. <laughs> well, he was famous here for his uh, uh, wild turtle soup, but he actually <laughs> had roasted woodchuck for the players after the game. In fact, uh, Preston Bennett and Monroe Bennett, or I have pictures up here of three of the uh, black baseball team. I just wanted to pay duty to them. Uh, some of the teams that came to Millbrook to play the Millbrook black team were the Havana Red Sox, New York Black Yankees, Pennsylvania Giants, and Newark, New Jersey Monarchs. In 1934, the Interstate Baseball League was formed. That was teams in New York and Connecticut. Uh, in Dutchess County here, over various years, there were Millbrook, Dover, Wingdale, Arlington, Amelia, Pine Plains, and Millerton. And in Connecticut, Sharon, Lakeville, Torrington, Winston, Oakville, and Kent. Usually every year there was eight teams, sometimes ten. Uh, it was a fairly successful league, and it, it was doing okay, and it was good baseball, and along came World War II. All the young men either enlisted or were drafted, and that was it until the war was over. 1945, uh, 
young men that had gone away at 18 or 20 years, some of you were even 25, 28 when the service came back, hadn't touched the ball, hadn't uh, anything to do with baseball for four or five years. So the interstate league picked up again. Now, uh, can I see the picture of the, uh, oh, is that up here with the team with the red circles? No, but it will be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and thank you to Linda Colt. She put a lot of pictures online for me. This is the 1946 Milbert baseball team. Everybody you see in a red circle served in the uh, armed forces. But they came back, they were 24, 28, 30, 32, some of them. Well, anyway, in the uh, uh, 1946 season, Milbrook had a 24 and 9 record. And they eventually got beat in the playoffs by Oakville, Connecticut. The next year, Milbrook beat Oakville in the playoffs, and Milbrook had a 15-3 and three record. But one of the things, back in those days, there was no television. And uh, most people couldn't afford to belong to a golf course. They didn't have uh, backyard swimming pools. Sunday baseball was the big thing. And that's when we started drawing 1,000, 1,500 people to the Milbert Community Center Field. And also when these teams went to Connecticut or to Arlington, anywhere in the Dutchess County, it was like a caravan of cars every Sunday going to these games. And this was outstanding ball. Now, minor league play today is considered just like triple A, double A. The Interstate Baseball League was almost on a quality of A. Many of the players that played for Milbrook, uh, I'm going to point out some of them later, signed minor league contracts. And by the time the war was over and they got back, their career, they, needed, they were getting married, having kids, and needed to work. And they never got to play pro ball. <clears throat> As I said, there were no gates at the ballpark. And <laughs> people either sat on the lawn or brought lawn chairs or blankets or on car hoods. And <clears throat> in right field, those elm trees overhung the field. Any ball hit into the trees was an automatic two bases. And because these cars were lined, it wouldn't have been like that. It would have been all the way around. Any ball that went under the cars or on the road was two bases. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as I was saying, uh, it costs money, and the money you had to pay umpires. I know my father was one of them, and back in 46 or 47, they got three bucks. And he had to buy balls and bats. <clears throat> and at various times, the Milbert teams were called the Milbert Millionaires because of all the wealthy people in the area, the Milbert uh, Legionnaires because the American Legion sponsored them, and the Milbert Merchants because uh, business people kicked in. And it also became a real rivalry with a lot of money being bet on games. Milbrook Arlington, Milbrook Amenia, a lot of money bet, by, by a lot. I couldn't give you a figure, I would say two to five hundred dollars in those days was a lot of money. <clears throat> uh, the rivalries were really intense, and I can remember Fritz Jordan from Arlington and his wife, Laverne, and she's still alive, she's a hundred, and my aunt and uncle were antagonists, and if her husband Fritz Jordan got up to complain about a call, <laughs> my aunt would big mouth, 
Sit down, you bum. Oh, go shut up, Fritz, and this and that. And when my uncle was on the field, Fritz's wife would do the same thing. <laughs> but when the game was over, they all went to the Grape Shade restaurant up here. And in those days, the Grape Shade provided spaghetti and meatballs and Italian bread for like three bucks, and beers were ten cents. Alcohol drinks were probably 30 cents. So, but it was it, intense rivalry, but friendly. At other town games, I told you people followed the Milbert team. They used to stop at such places, and some people here will remember Kingsley's Restaurant in Dover, the Brookside in the Mania, and Sharky's Restaurant in Millerton. Now, because those guys came back with years on them from the war, some of them kept playing right into the uh, 40s and 50s. Can we have a, uh, we'll look at a couple more pictures. There's the 1947 team that won the Interstate Baseball League. And I have pictures of all these teams here on the table for you to look at. <coughs> Next one. There's 48. The, uh, that 46 team, no one in that picture except the uh, Bat Boys are still alive. And this one here, the Bat Boys, this is uh, Jim Asbury, John Cradell, who's now a retired uh, New York State uh, uh, trooper, and Jim Hart, who's retired to Florida. But you always had to get new players because guys were getting older or getting hurt or transferred from work. Go ahead, the next one. There's a 49 baseball team, different bat boys. You got uh, Pat Simmons, uh, Jimmy Hart. Let's see, is the other one listed? John Cadell. And John Cadell. And at this point, Dutch Ruge right here, he played in the Interstate League until he was like 46 or 48, was one of our top uh, pitchers. Buck Gross right here. Buck Gross played baseball here for Milbrook in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and up to early 1960s. Next one, I think we have a picture of Buck. Get the next picture. Oh, the, I'll, I'll address this first. Back through the 40s and 50s, the Interstate League was very important here in, in Poughkeepsie. I, I went to the library and printed out some different games. You can see Dover, Edges, Millbrook, Nowhere to Meet Sharon, Winston wins. Every Monday, the lead story in a sports page in the journal wasn't the Yankees or Mets. It was the Interstate Baseball League. And I have a lot of uh, copies up here. And it shows you on that page, we ran box scores like the Major League does. The standings of the league. And we used to get so many calls on a, on a Monday morning. At that time, the journal was the uh, afternoon paper. And I had to have my pages done. And also in the 50s, the sports page had to be done 9.30 in the morning. And we had a deal with the Interstate League teams. We would run every game, every box score, every Monday. And when they weren't doing it, we would drop it. Well, the phone would start ringing 6.30 in the morning, the guys calling in the stories and the box scores. But also fans calling in and say, who won Milbert Dover, who won? And I had to have a secretary there because I had to put out, get the stories and write them. So we had a secretary giving out interstate baseball league scores. And that continued. I have a, a bunch of examples of it up here that this baseball was very important at that time. 
next one. That's just another copy. Uh, sometimes they did a roundup. And in the, by a roundup, I mean four games in one story and one headline. And here's a copy of them. Here's Arlington Winstead, uh, Milbrook Millerton. There would be four box scores there. And down here, the standings. So they got big coverage for many, but there was nothing else going on in the summertime around here except baseball. Now, Buck Gross, can we see the next one? I think we have one of Buck there, don't we? Okay. He played baseball, he was amazing, in four decades. And in 1970, they had a Buck Gross day here in Milbert. And all the players going back as far as that were still alive in those days turned out. And up here, after I'm done, if you want to look at it, here's the picture of Buck Gross at this Buck Day in Milbert, Buck Gross Day, and some of the players that played with him and his whole career. And I also have on here stories about the Milbert Giants, the, er, the black team, three different pictures here of that team. And this is a recap by Phil Scharr, who, who uh, managed Milbert in the 45 and 46 and 47. And he wrote a story about the Interstate League, how great it was, and how amazing it was that these guys came back from the war and their most important thing besides their family was baseball, playing baseball. Uh, Buck Gross, just for a couple of notes, uh, besides Millbrook High School being a standout, he was elected to the American uh, Baseball Congress All-Star Team in 1945 and played against Hall of Famer Hank Greenberg. Austin Knickerbocker, who was, I brought a story here and a picture of him. Austin Knickerbocker made it to the major leagues and he played for Connie Mack, Connie Mack's Philadelphia A's and before that he played for uh, Boston and Montreal. And over the years we had later players in the 1950s, uh, Al Majacomo, Played, he signed a contract with Milwaukee. Uh, Nick Benza, I forgot who Nick played with, was a very good infielder. Uh, we had a lot of great players here. Uh, what caused the uh, Interstate League to be so popular? The war was over and the guys were home to play. What ended the Interstate Baseball League was almost exactly what made it so popular. Early 1960s television. People had backyard swimming pools. They had cars. They went, uh, uh, they played golf. They played tennis. They, had, they played other sports. And the crowds got smaller and smaller, and it was hard to finance games and pay the bills. By that time, umpires and everything wanted more money. But one of the things that ended the Interstate Baseball League, the manager of the Winston, Connecticut team, Jim Davidson, I knew him very well. He inherited a lot of money at a big department store in Winston, Connecticut. Well, he wanted to win at any cost. So there was a guy named George Case who pitched for the Boston Red Sox. And eventually they let him go. Jim Davidson offered him 25 or 50 bucks to pitch for Winston because he wanted to win. There was no rules in the league that you couldn't do it. Pretty soon, other teams started trying to pick up the most important player was the pitcher. And if you could get a good pitcher, you would to stand a good chance of winning. Well then eventually the catcher said, 
I put in as much work as he does. I want something. Then you had players that were driving. We had some guys from uh, Highland, Paganusi and some of them uh, playing from Milbrook. They wanted bridge tolls and wanted gas. And it just all ran out. Uh, in 1966, that was the last year Milbert played in the Interstate League. And they were pretty shaky then, but they made it through the season and everything. And at that time, uh, Dutch Wisman had been the manager. He's a farmer in, in the Unionvale right now. Well, he died a couple, only three, four years ago. And he had been running around begging money from people, donations, anything they could to raise money, and he just got tired of it. And at the end of the 66 season, I was still on the board, and in early 67, Milbert, for the first time since 1934, was no longer in the Interstate League. They just couldn't raise them, and they couldn't get the players. I mean, at one point there, Milbrook started playing. There was a guy named Tucker Blanchfield, played for the, in the New York Yankees organization. They paid him some money here in Milbrook. And of course, the same thing. Well, if he's going to get some, I want some. And the league just kind of self-destructed. And like I say, and the people weren't there attending the games anymore. You didn't have the cigar box full of money every day. So it eventually died, but for those years from uh, 46 to like 64 or 65, Milbrook was in contention either winning or second many times, and a worst case scenario, third. So this was very, very good baseball here in Milbrook. And what's sad is I remember every one of these guys in these pictures, because I grew up as a kid, my uncle Bill Ahrens came to Milbrook in 1945 in uh, Roosevelt's Guard in Hyde Park. And he stayed here. He met my aunt and married her. And he used to take my older brother and I to ball. We used to go to every ballpark that I mentioned here in Connecticut and loved it. And people were still going to those games. But eventually, the. Uh, it just died naturally. It's very unfortunate. But I love that one picture I have that had the circles on, and that real picture is here. Of all those young guys that came back to Poughkeepsie and Milbrook that were in the services. <clears throat> and one of their first things was, I want to play baseball. And it was good baseball. So I have many fond memories of it. and. Uh, John Cading was supposed to be here tonight. He was going to talk about, he sold popcorn and soda at these games. And if you know John, anything that will bring him money. And he wanted to talk about it. And as of this morning, he was coming, he and his uh, sister. So, anybody got any questions about Nover? John? What was the minimum age of the players? Uh, I would say 18. Al Giacomo played in a game when he was 17. His brother Humbert was like 10 years older. Remember Humbert had the uh, pharmacy in Pleasant Valley with Giacomo Pharmacy? But Al got out of high school and signed with a couple uh, minor league clubs. And he had an outstanding high school record, like 24 and 5. And then he, now, I've got that here. I talked to him only a week or two ago. Okay. Al pitched for Milbrook in the late 1940s and early 50s. After that, and later signed several minor league contracts. He's now 90 and living in Florida. And when I told him about this, he said, I wish I could be there. I'd love to be there and talk about it. And I said, well, we don't have that much time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I got a couple quotes from Al. It was amazing that these young guys from Milbert came back after four years in the service of never having played ball. A couple did, but the bulk of them didn't. And he says, 
They loved being back in the game and they were as good as when they left. So, uh, Where did they get their training? These guys at Lake Strictly playing high school baseball here at Millbrook. Oh, who were the coaches? Millbrook coaches who taught Yeah, them? yeah. Who were they? Are they first? Oh, the long gone. Okay. Yeah. Everybody in that 1946 picture alone is a long gone. Sue? Can you go back to the uh, picture with the red circles and identify the people? Yeah, yeah. I don't think I need this, but just in case. This is uh, Dash Safari, Bill Aarons, Buck Gross, uh, Ed Osika, used to work in Dunn's Market here, Vinny Terlitis, Tommy Seppi, Humbert Majacomo, Joe Manzi, John Shar, any, any others you want to, Sam Sotero, Chubb Wicker that had the hardware store, Bud Baker, uh, the Bat Boys, this is uh, Buddy Morona, they had Morona's Market here in Newark, that was Buddy, uh, Ralph Shar, the manager, that guy on the end, it was uh, Huey Brennan, but this is that team that won that 1947 uh, championship for Milburg. Uh, in fact, Buddy just died within the last year, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And this was uh, one of the Anucci boys. Let me see. That's Joe. Is that Joe? Yeah. That's Joe. Yeah, and over the years, Milbert was always known as a baseball town. We had Little League, Junior League, uh, Senior League. Uh, the softball leagues, but that interstate league for that run of 20 years was just memorable, not only for me, but everybody that's around that still remembers that. Anybody else? You have the picture oh. of the Millbrook Giants? Yeah. We can name some of them. I, they're here. I know. Show it up there and I'll show what just... Well, you can't. Up. We can't put it on the screen well, now. You can't. Uh, this is... Uh, Preston Bennett's wife. Preston is in, here's the 1939 and 1940 Milbert Giants team. And this is the one that I was telling you that uh, Ernie Duncan is in the middle and used to provide uh, roasted woodchuck after the game. That was, you have any memories of the, I told him about all the, uh, I went to most of the games. Some of them were out of town. You know, right. With Preston, his brother, his cousins. <laughs> Ernie Duncan was his cousin. Was he? The manager, and then the Ernie Duncan Jr. played. Second I don't know, base. he was sort of young. Yeah. Second base. Yeah. yeah, he's in the pitchers too, the yeah. Duncans yeah. and the Monroes, but there's three pitchers here of the various New York, or the uh, Milbrook Giants the bike baseball team, and they were all outstanding. But I just want to make it right, you know, the, the Millbrook Giants were called the Millbrook Colored Giants. But I never heard of that. Yes, they were, because let me tell you, they could not play with the white team. Oh, I know that. All right? Yeah. And in 1934, 35, 36, yeah. Audie Bennett, Preston Bennett, two good ball players. Terrific, well, both Bobby, Bobby Lee. Bobby, well, Bobby came much later. Bobby was in the 1950s. Yeah, he went to school. 54, 55. He was after me in high school. Uh, <coughs> I remember everything you talked about. I remember all those, I remember it all. I remember the baseball field behind you when it had grass in the middle. <laughs> oh, really? I don't remember that. I remember that. <laughs> it had grass, and the reason they took it out, Buck Gross was the greatest second baseman I ever saw. He was good. Buck could play ball. He was second base. That's all he played. He wouldn't play anything else. But the ball kept hopping up out of the rough grass. It's not like the major leagues, you know, where it's a quarter of an inch high. You get too much grass and not bad bounces. So they took the grass out and made it all play. Yeah, because when I played the Little League and other ball and high school ball, 
that was that dirt field. I played third base and was happy that the grass was gone. Because you could bad bounce get you in the chops, you know. <laughs> I, 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 tell you, I was very, very fortunate. You know, I was never a big, big star, but I played on the team. I was a catcher on the 1950 high school team. Mm -hmm. And Nick Benson played uh, uh, shortstop and, and, uh, and, uh, and pitched. Uh, Bobby, uh, uh, Bobby Whalen played second base. Uh, uh, Bobby uh, Skidmore, who's still alive, played, yeah. he was a pitcher and played He's first. Uh, uh, Bobby, uh, 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 Bobby uh, uh, Morona played uh, third base. Terrific ball player. Gil Russell was Gil an Russell, outstanding Gil Russell about that left time. Field and uh, Lou Morocco was in center. He's still alive. He what, what is your name? Tony Fort. Oh, I didn't recognize. I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But, but that's why, and it wasn't until later that Audie Bennett and Preston Bennett played for the Milbert Legionnaires. Right. It wasn't until later. They, they are in play. one of the pictures here. They could not play, and that's why they had it. They called them, I know this young lady probably knows more not about you, but they call them the Milbert Colored Giants. I think you white people probably <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, hey, Tony, in several of the newspaper articles uh, that I did my research on, they're called the Milbert Color Giants. And I talked to Marion at lunch today, and she said no, and they were offended by that. That's why I dropped it tonight. Well, it's true. Because because it, it, was it, true. True. it was. It was true. Yeah. Because you, uh, was they couldn't play. Is that, you know, that's why Bobby Reed didn't make it. White people said it. Bobby yeah. Reed was... I, I, Cartman. Well, he was some ball. Yeah, he uh, he could hit, he could throw, he could run, he could do everything. Well, he went down to I think Tennessee or Kentucky went when down, when he signed a semi-pro contract. Georgia. Yeah. And you know but they were paying them like two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Oh. That was in the mid nineteen fifties. And he came. He said, I can't even eat <laughs> or get a room for two hundred dollars a month. Oh. And he came back. And he went on and pitched for about eight years for Millbrook in the Interstate League. And also, he played outfield. He could play any place. Dutch Ruge was from Rhinebeck. Right. He paid him $20 to pitch a game. Yeah. 20 bucks. Uh, another guy that got paid was uh, Weissman. Dutch Weissman? Dutch Weissman. Yeah. The left-hander from, from Grangeville. Hmm. He got paid. I saw Humbert Majacomo one time hit a ball from the home plate. You know where Max House is on center field? Yeah. He put that ball up on her lawn. <laughs> you talk about home runs. I remember one big key game, Millbrook and Arlington. I had a lot of money bet on it and a lot of fans there. And Bobby McKenna for Arlington hit a ball over the left field fence. They had a snow, a snow fence between the barn and the foul pole right here. And it went over the fence fair, but it was curvy. And it landed over the fence in foul territory. So the umpire ruled it foul ball. Really? And anybody knows once it passes the foul pole, it's, it's a home run. I can, what a brouhaha there was that day there. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot who won, but uh, anyone else? Who did, uh, you said Bobby Reed signed a semi-pro contract? It was in the Giants. Uh, oh, Giants? New York Giants. It was the New York Giants still in those days. And he signed a minor. He was good. Very, very good. Did he play? Did he play for them? In the minor leagues, yes. But he just couldn't live on the money they were paying. And the discrimination they were going through. So I tell you, Prince Jordan was a was a was a, a uh, Prince Jordan was a, a scout for the Giants, and he he signed Bobby Prince Jordan. Prince Jordan, I played ball for him in Arlington. I graduated from Arlington my senior year, '52. That's that's and why we got Charlie Johnson from Arlington. Yeah, that that was that was a bad move for Charlie. But anyway. Anybody else have a question? Because we have another speaker who's going to follow me here. No, no, no. But, he's, not, he's not going to now, so go ahead. I can do more. <laughs> I could every 
big house in between. Out. Did I'm he sorry. leave? Uh, he's leaving right now. He's, he needs to get back because he came down from uh, oh, no. oh, boy. <laughs> I think I about talked about everything I was going to. Basically, you know. John? Did the black team only play at other black teams? How did that work? Yeah. Uh, they used to play in Millbrook occasionally, but it was more like a scrimmage. They used to play against, in Poughkeepsie, was the Poughkeepsie Mohawks. But there were black teams uh, in New Jersey and upstate. I, right? Am I right? I can't remember who they played. I went to a lot of the games, but I, I think they played white teams against the white teams. I think I mentioned it here at one time who they played. Oh, here it is. Just some of the teams they played were the Havana Cuba Red Sox, uh, the New York Black Yankees, and then they had to use the word in their team name because you had the New York Yankees, uh, the Pennsylvania Giants, and the Newark, New Jersey Monarchs were just some of the teams that Milbrook and Poughkeepsie played. And there was a lot of good ball players there, but they were held back in the 1930s and that the early 40s because of all the discrimination and everything. When, what, when did they, when did Jackie Robinson, when did he, when did French hire him? Uh, 19... 47, that's it. Was it 47? 1946, uh, this is uh, Austin Knickerbocker, he went away, and he had signed with, he played for Boston, he played for Montreal, but he got to play for Connie Mack's Philadelphia A's, but uh, I had it down here who he, he played with, but this is all, this whole story is about the game where he played with Jackie Robinson. Jack, and Jackie Robinson was playing for Montreal. He wasn't in the major leagues yet. And he was just thrilled to death to have been in the game, the first major league game that Jackie Robinson played. And he said it is in the story, but I have all this stuff I'm gonna leave up here if anybody wants to, you know, get really into depth on this thing. Anybody else? You know, after the uh, 1967, when the Interstate League folded, some other teams in Connecticut and a few in the media, Millerton and that, tried to keep the league going. And they did for a couple of years. And they reorganized and they started another, but they didn't call it the Interstate League game. I forgot what they called it. And it only lasted a couple of years. People were no longer interested in going to local baseball games. Their wives and their family and friends might go, but they couldn't draw crowds and couldn't draw money. So, okay. All right, thank you very much.